I know I said I don't care about the comments on, on my stuff, and I really don't. You like it or not, but I was made aware of one gem on the protein thing uh, from last week regarding the me being right all along about protein. So here it is. The speaker believes he has been right all along about there being no limit and then protein intake just takes longer to digest in larger amounts. He is critical of researchers who previously disagreed with him. Good God, where to start? First off, what is with that passive-aggressive bullshit intro? The speaker? Have the balls to use my name, you fucking coward. He then says, has been right all along about there being no limit. Okay, I never said unlimited. Ever. That's a straw man argument, you know it. I defy anyone to show me where I have ever used the word unlimited. In fact, this is exactly what I said in the previous video. Now, I do think we could quibble about the use of the term no upper limit. What happens at 200 grams? What happens at 300 grams? I mean, I don't think there would be. I think it just takes that much longer to digest, which I've been saying for absolute years. But when you only use 25 and 100 grams, you can't really use language that strong, or you shouldn't. But that's neither here nor there. What I specifically said was that setting per permeal protein intake based on muscle protein synthesis was dumb as shit, and that protein takes longer to digest in larger amounts. Okay, belief implies faith. Factually, I was talking about the fact that longer meals, that larger meals take longer to digest from the late 90s to the early 2000s. Factually, my protein book published in 2008 provided digestion rates for protein. Factually, I pointed out that more protein may be required on a per day basis to support the adaptations in other tissue. Factually, in 2019, I put all of these debates and discussion points in an article. And factually, I brought up the fact that connective tissue synthesis is the same as muscle protein synthesis a month later. This has nothing to do with belief. Factually, I was right about all of these things. Belief never enters into it. Finally, he says, he is critical of researchers who previously disagreed with him. Another straw man, another deflection. You can disagree with me all you want, as long as it's based on evidence. I am critical of researchers who can't set up studies that don't have three independent variables. I am critical of researchers who are too fucking weak-minded to accept criticism of that methodology without relying on ad hominems before they bitch out of my group. I am critical of researchers whose response to my arguments amounts to, wah! I am critical of people who were then too intellectually dishonest to acknowledge that I was right along without this kind of bullshit. And I am critical of people that in response to a video where I laid out my evidence and the facts, responds to this kind of passive aggressive straw man bullshit. Seriously. If you're going to make a criticism of my work, at least make it a valid criticism. Let's get to the question. Okay, today's question states, Menno Henselman's recently claims that you should jump straight into maintenance or bulking after a fat loss phase. He is citing the Minnesota study also. Do you still recommend the two-week taper off after a bulk or cut? So first off, a brief comment about, about Menno Henselman. Uh, as a physiologist, he's a mediocre statistician, and he should have stayed in his lane. Over the years that I have known him, his ability to misrepresent data and misread it, assuming he even understands it, is epic. Let me add to that. Several years ago, he wrote a paper called Don't Eat Less and Move More, Eat More and Move More, something like that. When I made a critical comment about it, his initial immediate comment was, Lyle, are you off your meds? Menno Henselman is a douche who needs to eat a dick. Now I'll talk about him a little bit more on Friday. So let's look at the question. The Minnesota Semi-Starvation Study is one of the all-time classics of research. It was done back in the 50s um, by uh, Ansel Keys, who would later develop the uh, cholesterol hypothesis along a, a number of other things. It wanted to look at the physiological changes to what they called semi-starvation, which was similar to what was occurring in concentration camps. And if you want a non-technical look at this, you can read The Great Starvation Experiment, Ansel Keys, The Men Who Starved for Science by Todd Tucker. It's really good, and it's not super technical. Uh, the long and the short of it is it took a large number of uh, conscientious objectors to the war. And uh, to avoid being jailed or having to run to Canada, they did this study, and it was brutal. So over six months, they were put on 50% of maintenance calories. So semi-starvation is a little bit misleading. I mean, that is, right? Six months at 50% maintenance. It was a fairly low-protein diet, which is important. 
They did no formal exercise, but they were forced to do two hours of walking per day on top of normal daily chores. So like I said, it was meant to uh, mimic what was going on in the concentration camps. The long and the short of it is over six months, the men achieved the lower limits of body fat percentage. They lost a significant amount of muscle, and that was due to the uh, low protein and the lack of resistance training. And that is important when we, when we consider the data that they found. And they just measured everything. They measured just a ton of shit. There were two 1,200-page books written about this. I used to have copies, but they got lost in my move back from Salt Lake City, much to my dismay. It is often held up by guys like Lane Norton as proof of metabolic damage because it saw the largest decrease in um, energy expenditure. Uh, they, they weren't able to measure NEAT at the time, but like I said, they were forced to do two hours of walking per day, which at least maintained some of it. What happened the rest of the day, we don't know. And it would be fantastic if they could redo this study in the modern era. But other than a short study that did uh, one week maintenance, three weeks of extreme dieting, two weeks of overfeeding the obese individuals, it hasn't been done and it can't be done. Anyway, the data is the data. I mean, they were measuring uh, mainly uh, basal metabolic rate, and what they saw was a nearly 40% drop in total metabolic rate. Now, the men lost 25% of their body weight, and 25% of the total 40% was due to the body weight loss, right? Smaller body burns less calories. And then the other 15% was the adaptive component. So at the end of the study, the men were starved, showing all the adaptations that occur. Um, all they could think about was food, right? The physique athletes talk about food porn. And all the men, would they'd sit around and they would, they would put water in their food and their little thing of gruel and they would scrape it up to get every, every uh, calorie. And then they would talk about how they were going to open a restaurant, what they were going to eat. That's due to neuropeptide Y which is one of the neurochemicals that goes up and basically makes you more attentive to food. At the end of the study, they did a refeeding phase because they wanted to see what happened. So right afterwards, S24 is the end of six months. The first 12 weeks, they actually kept them on restricted calories that they kind of moved up in a step. Uh, and you can see if their body weight goes up. And then from after week 12, they let them go. They let them eat ad lib as much as they want. And you can see the body weight just keeps going up and up and up. And I'll mention this in the longer video on Friday, but one thing I wanted to note is uh, in the initial phase of the refeeding, the men actually lost weight because they stopped retaining water. Huh, that sounds really familiar. More on Fridays. And what they saw was that A, hunger was off the map. Right, because that's what happens uh, at the end of an extreme diet. And data in physique athletes show that. Calorie levels like double in, in the first week. They, they go from like 1,500 to 2,000, like four or 5,000 calories, because you're just, you're starving to death. I mean, that's all extreme dieting is, is long-term starvation. It's controlled starvation. That's what physique dieting is. But what they also saw, and this was surprising, is that body fat went up and up and up and actually ended up overshooting its original level. So they actually ended up at a higher body fat percentage than they started. Now these men were lean, and that's important because lean individuals are actually more likely to overshoot body fat percentage and end up at a higher body fat than they started than people with overweight. And the reason has to do with the muscle loss. It wasn't known then, but it's known now. Muscle sends an independent hunger signal to the brain. So when you lose muscle on a diet, again, Minnesota, low protein, no exercise. The body won't shut down hunger until you've regained both the, both the fat and the muscle. So in this case, they lost a ton of muscle dieting down, but since they weren't regaining it quickly, and we know that muscle, any muscle loss, regaining it takes much longer than regaining body fat, they didn't stop eating until they'd regained all the muscle, and by that point, they had regained a lot of body fat. Now, I've cited this study a lot. And they've reanalyzed this to death. Here's a partial list of the work DeLue has done looking at the data and redoing the metabolic rate calculations. This would actually led to the research that, that indicated that muscle was sending an independent appetite signal. The, the issue with it compared to physique dieting, compared to everything else, was again the low protein, the lack of resistance training. Because if you avoid muscle loss on the way down, and ensure to do the things that make you regain any small amount that were lost on the way back up, you don't overshoot body fat percentage. So in high-level trainees, 
physique athletes, if they're he doing heavy resistance training and eating enough protein, team they regain it back and they don't overshoot. So what implications does this have to do with whether or not you take a transition phase between bulking and dieting? The fuck if I know, because if anything, it says the opposite of what he's claiming. It says that when you're coming out of a diet, the Minnesota data, along with literally decades of other research, shows that you're primed predominantly for fat regain. So why would coming out of a diet and going straight into bulking be a good idea? What it has to do with switching between gaining and dieting, there is no relevance whatsoever. And I've got an article on my website called The, the Transition Phase that, that talks about this. I'm trying to keep it shorter, so I'm not going to get into that. I'll put a link in the notes. We know that in a deficit, the adaptations to that deficit in terms of metabolic rate decrease. Uh, BMR, meat often goes down, especially at the extremes. TEF is down, but that's just because you're eating less, etc. We know that those adaptations are larger in a deficit than when you come back to maintenance. And we know that moving calories simply to maintenance allows for those to reverse. And we know that these are delayed. There was a study in um, Special Forces that sort of did this. They were in extremely low calories, very little sleep, intensive amounts of training. They ended up at the lower limits of body fat percentage. Testosterone was down. Cortisol was up. Thyroid was in the toilet. I mean, like all the adaptations to starvation. And with one week of refeeding, those things normalized. We know that thyroid levels take at least two weeks to exert full expression, if not longer. Coming out of a diet, when metabolism is suppressed, when fat storage in is increased due to increases in all the enzymes, literally the worst thing you could do would be to raise calories into bulking range above maintenance. Stabilizing for two weeks at maintenance calories. And I'm not talking about Lane's reverse dieting bullshit. I've said since 2004 when I wrote a guide to flexible dieting that uh, you should bring calories to maintenance in no less, ideally in about three days, but it should take you no longer than two weeks, and that can be beneficial uh, for appetite control. And it depends on the situation. Are we talking about a lean physique dieter who's at 4% and who needs to get fat anyway, or uh, uh, the, the general dieter, but on average, somewhere between three days to two weeks to get to maintenance. And once you're at maintenance, you need to stay there at least two more weeks. So if it takes you a longer time, you, you need to stabilize even longer than that to make sure these adaptations have reversed. And doing that allows those hormonal, some of those metabolic adaptations to normalize so that you're in a better hormonal state before you go back to eating higher calories. That's on top of the fact that if you were dieting and have reduced your training volume or tensor your quality, those two weeks at maintenance give you opportunity to get things back to where they need to be to recover psychologically, physiologically, to be prepared to train intensely. You can't just jump back into gaining out of dieting under most conditions. And this depends on body fat percentage. This depends on a bunch of variables. Go read the article on my website or this is going to be 40 minutes long. The point is the adaptations to dieting, prime you for fat gain, jumping to higher calories is not only not supported by the Minnesota data, but based on decades of data is the worst fucking thing you could possibly do. The Minnesota study, if anything, says the opposite of what he's claiming regarding jumping from dieting into Vulcan. But that's pretty much the norm for him, along with this industry. I love it when people cite studies in me, and literally, they make my point and say the exact opposite of what they're claiming, like in this case. So far as the transition from gaining to dieting, that's a little bit more speculative on my part. It has to do with the fact that, like, allowing muscle mass to stabilize, something that has been anecdotally seen, and that doesn't mean anything. There's no science on it I'm aware of. But we know that adaptation does not stop immediately when you stop training hard. Spending two weeks to, you know, clean up the diet like everyone used to do, making any adjustments to your training. If you haven't been doing cardio, you need to bring cardio back in to start reactivating those fat burning pathways. Spending a couple weeks to stabilize between bulking and dieting makes sense, but I'm more speculative about that. So the short answer is that yes, I do still recommend them, especially from dieting to gaining. There is no question that when the body is primed for fat gain, the singularly worst thing you can do is jump into above maintenance calories. There is no debate. The Minnesota study says the opposite, as does seven plus decades worth of data. So far as the transition from gaining to dieting, it is less well established. I would be the first to admit it's more speculative. I don't think it will hurt. It might help. And the big conclusion is that as usual, Menno is full of shit. He also needs to eat a bit. So there you go. Uh, for the record, I do not read or answer or respond to comments either on YouTube or Instagram. 
nor do I delete them like all the other cowards in the industry if I don't like them. Um, I simply can't be bothered. If you have a question you'd like me to maybe consider answering, send it to me at questions at bodyrecomposition.com, and I might get to it, or I might not. There's just no way to tell with me. It's part of my charm. See you next time.